This video will look at the use of the metric and its associated basis vectors using cylindrical coordinates to determine the distance travelled by an object along a circular helix between any two given times. So here's a picture of the situation. So we have an object uh, on this circular helix travelling along this path all the way around and going up. Uh, the path starts over here on the x-axis on the right, just at that point there. See the radius is A. We have a coordinate system X, Y, Z set up in the middle of the helix and starting at the base. So the task will be to calculate the distance traveled by the object for any given time interval, so between any two points in time. Um, what will be the distance traveled by this object? So a reasonable choice of coordinates for this problem are cylindrical ones. That's rho, phi and Z and they're related to Cartesian coordinates by these expressions here, these equations. X is rho cos phi, Y is rho sine phi, Z is Z, Z equals Z. So the position vector here, R, X, I, Y, J, Z, K, will be this object here. All right, now the next step is to calculate the basis vectors for this coordinate system so that we can work out eventually the metric for this space. So E subscript rho, because there's three variables, rho, phi, and z. So dr, d rho, the partial derivative of this vector with respect to rho is this object here. So the next basis vector, e subscript phi, will be dr, d phi, and that will give us this object here. And then e subscript z will be dr, dz, which just gives us k. Now the metric for this coordinate system will be uh, this matrix here. Now these are the basis vectors, the scalar product of the basis vectors. And so for instance, G subscript rho, rho means E subscript rho dotted with E subscript rho. And that result there, and when we perform that operation, we get 1. Uh, this one here, G subscript phi phi, that's this uh, basis vector here, dotted with itself. So dotted with that, and we'll get rho squared. And GZZ, that's this one here, dotted with itself, we'll get 1. All the others, because of orthogonality, will go off to 0, they'll drop off. And so here's our metric for this space, for these coordinates. Next, the, the length of some part of the arc, however much we want to look at, uh, that is parameterized in terms of some variable such as tau, is given by this expression here. So here's the metric. Is the derivative of each of the coordinates with respect to tau. And then we integrate with respect to tau between tau subscript 1 and tau subscript 2, so that's one point in time, another point in time. So what do we know about the variables rho, phi and z for a circular spiral, or circular helix I should say? The radius of the helical spiral is fixed, so in this case rho is equal to a, so rho the radius is constant. Now one other thing we'll do is we'll say that this object carries its own clock and so we can parameterize its position in terms of the time tau measured by this clock. So this object's traveling this circular uh, spiral helix and it carries its own clock with it. All right. We'll say the time taken to complete a single revolution is the period which we will call capital T and is a fixed quantity given that the radius is fixed. The angle phi swept out by the object on each revolution will at any given time tau be some proportion of 2 pi because it goes from 0 to 2 pi and then back starting from 0 again all the way around because it completes one revolution, one complete revolution as it travels around. And so for instance if tau, if the period sorry were 10 seconds and the clock says that we're 5 seconds into that revolution then 5 over 10 is a half. So we've swept out half of 2 pi, so we will have swept out pi. So that's how phi is related to the parameter tau, which measures the time carried by a clock that the object carries with, with its, is a, its own clock as it carries, as it goes around the path. Right, the distance by which the object rises in the z direction is also proportional to time, and so we're going to have z will be b, some constant b times tau. Right, in parametric form, our coordinates now look like rho, phi, z, and now rho is a. Phi is 2 pi times tau over the period t, capital T, and z is b times uh, tau, where b is a constant and a is a constant. 
T is also a constant because a period is fixed for each revolution. It's the same. Right, these coordinates have the following derivatives. d rho d tau is 0. d phi d tau is 2 pi on capital T, so all of that's a constant. And dz d tau is b. Now what we want is the arc length covered by the object, what distances it travel along the arc, along the curve, between the times tau 1 and tau 2. And that will be given by this object here. So here we are, back to this integral again. Alright, so what we need to do is expand out the metric and expand out each of these. Remember there are three coordinates, and the off-diagonal terms are zero, so it's only the diagonal terms on the matrix we were looking at earlier that we had to consider. So we have g rho rho, d times d rho d tau times d rho d tau, plus g phi phi, subscript phi phi, d phi d tau, d phi d tau, plus g z z, subscript z z, d z d tau, d z d tau, and then square it all up, and then integrate that with respect to tau. If you remember from the matrix, we had a diagonal matrix. The leading entry on the top left right was 1. The middle entry uh, in the middle of the matrix, phi phi, g phi phi, was rho squared. Now rho is a, the constant uh, in the radius, so it's a squared. And uh, g z z was 1. And we found that um, d z d tau, d z d tau is b squared, b times b. Now we collect terms. Now this disappears at 0. We're left with a squared times this object here plus b squared, d tau, tidying that up. Now, evaluating this integral between tau 1 and tau 2, all this business under the square root here is just a constant. There's no variables to integrate in there. That's purely a constant. So the integral just becomes tau 2 minus tau 1 times that constant. Now, if we're not concerned ourselves with a period of revolution, but just simply set phi equal to tau, so we rescaled it and didn't worry about the, um, the period tau, uh, the period capital T, sorry, um, and we just set phi equal to tau, then the resulting derivatives would have been d rho d tau is 0, d phi d tau would have been now 1, because d phi d tau is 1, d z d tau would have been b, and substituting that into our integral, we get this object here, which uh, which leads to the square root of a squared plus b squared times d tau, and then we just, this is a constant, so we evaluate this integral and we end up with tau 2 minus tau 1. And this result looks a little bit more familiar, you might see in books or elsewhere. Um, uh, this is a more usual result, you might see quoted in the, these sorts of problems. But that's how you do it with cylindrical coordinates, um, and uh, that really did, that takes care of, that's the end of this problem now.